Hi again, everybody. So I'm going to go ahead and give a little overview of statistics uh, for review and reference. I'm just going to go ahead and make sure that my camera is focused. Awesome. So I randomly asked 10 of my college students the following question during these coronavirus times. And so the question was, how many times in the last seven, seven days have you left your home? And I randomly chose 10 responses. That's my set number right there. And these were the responses, 14 times, nine times, five times, six times, zero times, 10 times, 15 times, 10 times, four times, 16 times. So the very first thing I need to do is I need to put my data set in order from least to greatest. So here I go. My data set is now in order. And notice that I crossed this out. That means that whenever I wrote the value here, I crossed it out. So I made sure that I'm efficient and I'm doing this correctly. I don't um, reproduce a number here more than once by mistake or I omit one by mistake. That's what those little slashes is. And notice there's a check mark here because once I put it in order, I make sure and count and make sure that my data set number is maintained. So here is my data set now in order right here. And now I'm going to go ahead and proceed to find the mean. So the mean is X bar. That's the symbol for the sample mean. And the formula for that is you sum up all the values in your data set and then divide by your set number. So once I take 0 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 9 plus 10 plus 10 plus 14 plus 15 plus 16, that gives me 89. I divide that by my set number, which is 10. 89 divided by 10 gives me an X bar value of 8.9. So what does this mean? That means that on average, based on this data set here, um, the amount of times that they left or, uh, in the last seven days is about 8.9 times. Okay, that's mean. My next measure of central tendency is median. And median means what is the middle value of the middle data point of your data set. So notice that I have numbers here. And what I did is I counted off. So that's one, one, remove it, two, two, three, three, four, four, five, five. So I was able to find visually the center of my data set. And so it's right here. And notice that I do have two values that sit dead in the center. So that happens when my data set is even. So since my data set is even, both of these values are going to now be used to calculate my median. So since I have two values in here that are my median, I must take an average of these two. So again, I'm going to apply this little formula, but just to these two values. So 9 plus 10 divided by 2, so I'm only looking at two values, gives me 19 divided by 2. So that tells me that my median of this data set is 9.5. So let's look a quick crash course on mean, median, and mode. Mean is the average. So this means if I take the values of all these data points and then I add them up and divide by the set number, it tells me 8.9 is my mean. Median is an analysis of location in your data set. So if I look at placement in the data set, my data set must be in order for this to happen. Um, my median is 9.5. And mode is now the popularity contest. This means which value appears the most in your data set. Notice that all these other values, with the exception of 10, appear only once, and 10 appears twice. So that means that my mode is 10. Since I only have one value in my mode, I have a unimodal distribution. That means that I got a little lump there, and then that little lump only occurs once in my distribution. So here is my mean, median, and mode. Again, if you have any issues, rewind, 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 replay. If you have anything, contact me. My website's on here, too, so you can do that. So now that I found my mean, median, and mode, I want to know, well, how deviant or how far apart from my mean are these values? So that's what I mean. I'm now going to look at standard deviation. So I'm going to go ahead and look at standard deviation now. In order for us to look at standard deviation, I create a little uh, graphic organizer. To analyze standard deviation, I must start with my mean. That is the value that I'm going to compare all my data points to. And I'm going to see how far away each of these data points is from, the, from this guy. So notice I now have a little graphic organizer. Here, all I'm doing is I'm numbering. This is my data set number. I have 10 values in my data set. And before, my data set was listed horizontally. 
let me show you right there. My data set is in order horizontally, but this time I'm pl placing my data set in a vertical list. So this just X means that's the data point in my data set. Remember, standard deviation is a measure of the average distance away from the mean that the data set has. So I need to compare each of these values and then say, well, how far away are they from the mean? In order for me to analyze the distance away from the mean, I must look at this difference here. So this here is analyzing the difference. Each point on the data set is away from the mean. So I'm going to go ahead and do exactly what this column is asking me to do. It's asking me to take the data point and subtract it from the mean. This mean in this set is 8.9. So I go ahead and take this point, subtract it from 8.9. Bam, gives me negative 8.9 right there. Same thing. So I'm doing that to all these values. So this column here, right here, it's indicating to me two things. It's giving me how far each data point is from the mean, and it's also giving me a direction. For example, I have four values. These four values, these four data sets here, are uh, below the mean because the distance is negative. And these six values here are above the mean are uh, because their distance is positive. However, remember, standard deviation is an average distance. So I can't use these direction-wise because... I can't find an average if I have negative and positives. It's going to nullify and it's not going to give me an, a correct value. So I must do something to this number to get rid of these negative signs. I must square it. So that's right. This next column just says take the value you got on this one and square it. So that's exactly what I'm doing. I take every single one of these values and I'm now squaring it. Okay. So by squaring it, I remove that direction component of it. And now I do have some type of value that I can now all add and find an average. So notice here, this right here is indicating, take the summation of that column. Here is my column. And all I'm doing is taking a summation of it. And I get 242.90. Once I add all these values, that's what I get. So I'm now going to take an average of this, but I'm going to find the variance of it, and it's n minus 1. So remember, this is a sample set. I didn't take a population analysis. This is just a sample of 10 students in my class. So that's why my variance, not it's not being divided by n. It's being divided by 1 less than that. So it's going to be n minus 1, which is 9, since my data set is 10. So again, 242 divided by 9 gives me a variance. So variance is an average of the squared distances, okay? So 242.9 divided by 9 gives me 26.9. So this is my variance. I need to know the variance in order for me to find my standard deviation. So now, here I go. I'm going to find my standard deviation. Standard deviation, this is the formula, which means to get the standard deviation, I must square root that average of the squares. Why? Because remember here, I couldn't take this distance because they had direction and those negatives and positives weren't going to work when I try to find uh, the average. So that's why I squared on so that I get rid of that negative positive problem. So, but I was able to take a distance of that, but I wanted to undo this square so I could go back to doing something like this. That's why there's a square root here. So to find the standard deviation, all I have to do is take the square root of the variance. My variance is 26.989. Take a square root of that. That gives me that. My standard deviation is 5.195. Looking at all these values, so these are the, the values of my data set right here. Somebody didn't leave their house at all during the last week. Somebody left their house 16 times within the last seven days, right? This is my data set, and I'm comparing it to the mean, 8.9. So how? what's the average distance away from the mean? It's 5.195 units away from the mean. That's what standard deviation is indicated. Cool. Moving on. So now I'm going to also see, is this data normally distributed? Remember, normal distribution is when I plot my data, does it have this curvature that has like a bell-shaped curve, symmetry, and stuff like that? Well, I have this test to see if it's truly symmetrical or, or if it's truly normal. Uh, the empirical rule has three tiers. In order for data to be normally distributed, it must satisfy the following requirements. The first requirement, requirement means that 68% of my data, at least 68% of my data, must be within one standard deviation from the mean. Okay. Second requirement, 
95% of my data must be within two standard deviations away from the mean. 99.7% of the data must be within three standard deviations away from the mean. So in order to analyze this and uh, test this data set against the empirical rule, I need to use two things. First, my mean, 8.9, and my standard deviation, which is 5.195. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create this interval of analysis, which means my first year is comparing the, the data sets, frequencies, and data points against one standard deviation. Second tier is being compared against two standard deviations. And the third tier is being compared against the three standard deviation margin. So I need to find out what that is. So one standard deviation is 5.15. Twice that is 10.39. So 5.15 times 2 gives me 10.39. And three times that is 5.15 times 3 gives me 15.585. So now I need to find the interval analysis. An interval is a starting and an ending point, right? So in order to find the interval of analysis, it's always compared in, against the mean. The mean is the center value of this interval. So to find the starting point, I look at whatever distance I'm going to be analyzing, and I subtract it from the mean. That's my starting point. And whatever distance I'm analyzing to get the ending point, I use the mean and I add it. So let's see. To find the starting interval of analysis for the first tier, which is a margin of one standard deviation away from the mean, I take my mean and I subtract 8.9 from uh, by 5.195, and that gives me 3.705. Again, to find this, the ending point, I take my mean and I add this value. So that gives me 3.705 and 14.095. That means that there's the mean. This value here would be, this distance here would be one standard deviation, and this distance here would be one standard deviation. So if this is 8.9 and this is 5.195, that means that my starting value here is 3.705. And if this is 8.9 and this right here, this distance here is uh, 5.195, that means that my ending value here is 14.095. Okay, so that's how I found this one. Consequently, the same way I do this one here. So again, to find to get this number, I take my mean and I subtract this value. So now I'm widening out because now before it was one standard deviation. Now I'm making it twice as big. So of course, this data set is this range here is a lot wider. This little analysis interval here, and then I'm going to do the same thing for the three standard deviations right here. So again, this one is always going to be the mean. 8.9 subtracted by whatever the uh, margin is for this tier. So 10.9, 10.39 gives me that. And then 8.9, which is this guy now, plus 10.9 gives me 19.29. And I'm going to do the same thing here again. 8.9, take away this, gives me that. And 8.9 plus this gives me this. So this here is my interval analysis. So if I'm going to create now a frequency analysis, I'm going to go back to my data set that's in order. So right here. I'm going to use this one right there. Right there. And I'm going to ask myself, um, how many of my values are within this data, this interval? So this interval starts at 3.705 and ends at 14.095. Is zero part of that interval? No, it's outside of it. I can't count it. How about four? Yes, it is. There's a palito for that. How about five? Yup, right there. Six? Yup, right there. Nine? Uh-huh. Two tens. So there's two palitos for the ten, right? And then uh, 14? Is 14 part of it? Yes. Remember, this is after 14, so 14 is still included. How about 15? No, 15 doesn't fit in this anymore. And 16? Tampoco. Nope. So out of the entire data set of 10 values, only 7 of them were part of this interval. And that's what my frequency analysis is. There's a little palitos they teach you in kindergarten, you know. There you go. So now i got to take this and say, well, what percent of my data is that? So I'm looking at a relative frequency. In order to find the relative frequency, I take whatever I got for the frequency and divide it by the set number. My set number was 10. 
So 7 over 10 gives me 0 0.70, which converts into 70%. Okay? I'm going to do the same thing again for the next here. Now the starting point is negative 1.490, and my ending point is 19.29. So if you notice, my minimum value is 0, which is already part of that. And my maximum value is 16, which is still within this, which means that all my points are part of this interval. 10 out of 10 gives me 100%. Now look at this one. This one's even wider. And negative 6.685 to 24.485. All my data points are within this interval. So 10 out of 10 right there. So the empirical rule test means that at least... It needs to have at least 68, which means that if this number here is 68 or more, it passes. 70 is greater than 68, bam, passes. 100% is bigger than 95, bam, it passes. 100% is bigger than 99.7%, bam, it passes. So what can I say? This data set is normally distributed because the data set passes all tiers of the empirical rule. Remember, the empirical rule must satisfy all tiers in order for the data set to be considered normally distributed. If it only passes one and not another one, then it's not normally distributed. It has to satisfy all tiers. Okay. Moving on. Now I'm going to go into a box plot analysis. Okay. So standard deviation has a analysis of the mean and distance away from the mean from the data points now box plot is now analyzing the range the difference um, in the quartiles um, qu cutting it into quarters and halves of the data set okay so again here's my data set in order okay and I need to figure out what the minimum is, what my first quartile is, what my second quartile is, what my third quartile is, and my maximum. My first quartile is literally the end of the first quarter of this data set. So let's consider and compare this data set to like a football game. If you consider this a football game, the end of the second quarter is considered halftime, right? Which means the main center value of this this uh, data set is quartile two. So 9.5, remember that from the median uh, when I first started this video, that's how it happens. I went one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, five, five. There's two five fives here. I circled them because I had two values. This is an even set data set. And I had to take the average of these two, 19 divided by two, 9.5. So the quartile two is the 50th percent. That's the halftime show, which happens at the end of the second quarter of a football game, right? Notice now that I separated my data set into two subsets, my first half and my second half. So how would I describe the half point of, a, of the first half of a football game? The end of the first quart quarter, right there, quartile one, which means quartile one is the 25th percentile, quartile two is the 50th percentile, quartile three is the 75th percentile of the data set, okay? Min is the zero, uh, the zero percentile and max is the 100th percentile, okay? So if I look at just this one, now I do the same process. One, one, two, two, three, bam. Five is the middle value of the first half, which that makes in my code Q1. And then again, one, one, two, two, three, bam. 14 is the middle value of the second half, which makes it the quartile three, cool? So I have my minimum right there, my maximum. This data set must be in order for this to be analyzed, okay? So now I'm going to look at the range. The range is how far apart are my maximum and my minimum? Again, taking a difference, analyzes distance. So 16 minus 0, this data has a range of 16 units. That means that from the minimum to the maximum, they're 16 units away from each other. That's the range. Now I'm going to look at the interquartile range, which means the middle 50% of the data. How long is that? So that means I take a distance between the third quartile and the first quartile. Q3 minus Q1 gives me 14 minus 5, which is 9. So that means that the middle 50% of my data has a range of 9 units. Okay. Now I'm going to look at outliers. So outliers are considered if they exceed a distance that's 1.5 times the interquartile range. Okay. So 1.5, the interquartile range, gives me 1.5 times 9, which is... 
this is the distance before Q1 and after Q3 that I must consider in order to create a boundary of outliers. So if my data surpasses these values, then I do have outliers in my data set. So notice again, this value here is the value that I compare against the first quartile and the third quartile. So before the first quartile means I'm going to subtract that value. And after the third quartile means I'm going to add that value. So negative 8.5 and 27.5, those are my boundaries. So now I'm going to go ahead and do the box plot. Easiest way to remember the box plot is my minimum and maximum are endpoints. Q1, Q2, Q3 are line segments that create the box. So line, 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 and then I just connect those and bam, I have a box. And these guys are just the little whiskers. So the box plot is also known as a box and whisker plot because these look like little bigotitos. Boom. So I'm going to create a number line. And so this number line must showcase at least the boundary where my outlier on the lower end happens and my outlier on the upper end happens as well as my minimum and maximum. So my minimum is greater than this. So this will be the value that I'm going to start with around that value. And then this is less than this value. So this is the value that I'm going to end with. So I went negative 10 and I should have really just ended it here, but you know, I just wanted to make a showcase that I, I, as long as I can see these guys here, I'm okay. So again, negative 10 to above 40. That's cool. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to plot my boundaries. These are boundaries that indicate from this point forward, I have outliers. So negative 8.5 and 27.5. So this area over here is an outlier region. And so is this area over here. So it's before the Q1 and after Q3. Okay. Now I'm going to go ahead and proceed to plot this. Again, 0, it's an endpoint. 16 is an endpoint. And then Q1, which is 5, bam, there's a line. 9.5, so it's a little bit left of 10 right there. And 14, a little bit left of 15. There's another line segment connected, and there is my box plot. So notice that my entire data set is within this range. If there's nothing that's in this side or this side, so I do not have any outliers. Okay, so this is, we analyzed mean, median, and mode. Those are measures of central tendency. We also analyzed variance and standard deviation, which looks at the average distance a point is from the mean on the data set. And we also looked at box plots with its analysis. And so we looked at the median analysis for the data set. Hope you enjoy. See you guys later.